Okay, now we'll kick it over to Michael. Thank you very much, Michael. Yeah, thank you. Um, so hello everyone, thank you for being here. Um, everyone at SRF Ed by now will know that uh, aging is a, you know, the major cause of uh, mortality in the world and the cause of multiple diagnosable diseases. Um, and I think you all know we're again it. Um, <clears throat> It's clear from listening to a lot of people's presentations and talking to people that there is a lot less understanding about why SENS Research Foundation takes a particular approach to uh, medical treatments against age-related degeneration and what the damage repair approach is and why we favor that over more conventional approaches that a lot of other labs have taken in the past and are still taking now. Uh, so, this presentation is about explaining in a bit more detail what the damage repair approach is and why we favor it over those other approaches. Um, so we'll start at something that is sort of accepted by pretty much everyone in the field, uh, which is how we age. Now, when people sometimes will say why we age, and that's a somewhat ambiguous question because there's sort of the grand evolutionary teleological questions around how does it come to be that this degenerative process sets in on us, you know, does that imply there's some sort of selection process? Uh, that's not the question we're asking here. The question we're asking here is just, what is the cellular molecular process that leads a young, healthy, developed 25-year-old to progressively come, you know, less and less fast, less and less rapid in their processing speed, slowly accumulate uh, soft tissue injuries and a variety of diagnosable age-related diseases and eventually die of some age-related cause that uh, essentially never happens to that 25-year-old. Um, and what we're dealing with here is a intrinsic process, right? So you could certainly worsen the course of your aging by smoking or drinking a lot of alcohol uh, or any number of insults you can throw onto your body. But you know, even the most optimal lifestyle that you lead, you are still going to age and lead to the accumulation of age-related diagnosable indications. Why does that happen? So uh, our metabolism, uh, all the processes that keep us alive are constantly generating unintended side effects of various kinds that lead to damage to the cellular and molecular components of our bodies that keep us alive. Um, when I say damage, I want to be quite particular. People will sometimes use damage, in the, even in the scientific literature, in a very broad way to indicate transient reversible lesions, and that is not what we are talking about here. So uh, things like amidori products on uh, proteins or reversible oxidative lesions that uh, basic scission repair or other DNA repair mechanisms could repair. We're dealing here with stable structural damage to long-lived molecules and cells that once it happens, your body does not have the ability to reverse. Um, so this could be, for instance, uh, in the course of oxidative phosphorylation, occasionally your mitochondria generate reactive oxygen species. Those reactive oxygen species will occasionally cause damage to the DNA and if that becomes fixed as a mutation, that does not reverse over time, and those accumulate as you age. And that's the kind of damage that we're talking about, intrinsically driven and accumulating in your tissues over time. Um, and because those are the functional units whereby the machine that is your body uh, carries out its various functions, as you progressively lose functional units in your tissues, you progressively lose the proper function of those tissues. And eventually, that reaches a so-called threshold of pathology, at which point you have a particular diagnosable disease of aging. Um, so as an example, a very simple example, uh, dopaminergic neuron loss and uh, Parkinson's disease. So uh, everyone is born with somewhere in the ballpark of 200,000 to 400,000 dopaminergic neurons in a region of the brain called the substantia nigra. And over the course of your life, you progressively lose those. Can people see my pointer? Yes. Yes, okay. So you progressively lose those. And once you reach a certain threshold where you don't have enough of those neurons to carry out their function, 
uh, in the tissue, you can't any longer control the fine motor control out of the striatal targets that uh, the dopaminergic neurons reach. And you start having the motor symptoms that you use to diagnose Parkinson's disease. Now, that is just sort of the quote, normal close quote course of aging. But if you happen to be born with a lower number of dopaminergic neurons than the average person, even if you are losing them at the same rate, you will cross the threshold of pathology at an earlier age. Uh, or if you have the normal number of dopaminergic neurons and you are losing them more quickly because you have a variant in uh, the protein called alpha synuclein, or you have a dysfunctional gene in your mitochondria, which generates more damage, or you, for some reason, uh, handle calcium in a slightly abnormal way, you will, again, reach the threshold of pathology at an earlier age. Equally, you could be born with you know, perfectly normal number of neurons and a normal gene set, but if you are subject to some insult, uh, for instance, the pesticide paraquat, you may start losing those neurons much more rapidly in middle age, uh, and as a result, uh, again, reach the threshold of pathology at an early age. If you live long enough and didn't die of any other age-related disease, even this person uh, would eventually develop Parkinson's disease. Most people, when they get into their 80s, even if they don't have diagnosable Parkinson's disease, they have slower motion and other fine motor control that you can diagnose that has been labeled Parkinsonism, uh, but it just doesn't reach the actual threshold of diagnosable disease of Parkinson's disease. And so that's a very simple example, but if you look at it progressively, all the so-called diseases of aging are characterized by this same sort of process. Um, to complicate the linear schematic that I've given you a moment ago a little bit, uh, as you progressively accumulate damage and uh, proceed to actually have pathology, uh, that tends to feed back on metabolism. So um, as an example that some of you will know, uh, as you accumulate senescent cells over time, those uh, secrete a secretory phenotype uh, and those uh, proteins are bioactive, they are inflammatory, and that of course tends to further distort metabolism going backwards. Or another example that we'll get into a little bit later, uh, beta amyloid in the brain, which is a damaged protein that uh, leads eventually to Alzheimer's disease, uh, recruits microglia to clear it out. And if you get enough beta amyloid in your brain, those microglia will progressively become increasingly inflammatory. And again, that will alter the course of metabolism and further increase the amount of damage that you are accumulating. So, okay, this is the basic process that we are dealing with. What do we do about it? Um, today's medicine, what Matt Caberlin calls reactive disease care, uh, we wait until you have some particular diagnosable disease of aging, and we either try to attack that uh, damaged organ directly, so this could be like a stent in your heart uh, or, you know, surgery of some kind or another to deal with an organ that is clearly diseased, uh, or we deal with the quite late stages uh, intervening between accumulating damage and pathology. So this could be uh, something where you are trying to deal with some damaged tissue in a way that it doesn't progress to pathology. The problem is, of course, uh, you are dealing with this at a late stage when a lot of damage has already accumulated. And also, uh, you haven't stopped the process that is still leading progressively forward into more and more pathology. And that, as we've noted, is feeding back uh, onto metabolism and damage and causing the process to accelerate. And so uh, I don't want to rubbish the fact that you know we are much better at dealing with cardiovascular disease or cancer than we were in the 1950s. But certainly, I think we would all agree that our solutions are limited and much less than we might desire. So there has long time been a recognition that we want a more preventative approach. And the best approaches that are available today are back here between metabolism and damage. Uh, so here you are saying, well, if this process gets started with metabolic processes leading to the accumulation of cellular molecular damage, let's alter metabolism in a way that will cause 
less damage to accumulate and therefore forestall the development of pathology. So um, in today's medicine, that is aggressive use of preventative medicine. So uh, giving person a statin once they have elevated cholesterol, even if they don't have any cardiovascular disease, it's also good lifestyle like uh, exercise and a healthy diet. Uh, and it's also the great majority of biogerontology or geroscience work that is done today, where uh, whether you're dealing with cow restriction or rapamycin or, or a lot of the work that you guys are doing, uh, it really is on this, let's find a way to alter metabolism in such a way that less damage accumulates and deal with it at that end. Um, that definitely has some advantages over waiting until you already have advanced disease before you deal with it. Um, but it does some pretty clear disadvantages, one of which is uh, we don't start treating people from the time they are five years old. Uh, typically, a person is only going to even be considered a candidate for such medicine when they are middle aged, at which point a lot of cellular molecular damage has already accumulated and you don't have the opportunity to attack that damage. Um, also, because you are modulating metabolism, uh, well, we spent a billion years evolving the metabolic processes that you are laying your hands upon in your arrogant way. Uh, and of course, those processes are there to keep you alive and fit. Uh, inevitably, modulating those leads to intrinsic side effects. I'm not talking about sort of radically off target effects where, you know, a drug also binds with a protein it was not intended to bind to. I'm talking about, you know, the, the fact that when you give a person statins, uh, a certain percentage of them will develop diabetes because of the effects on likely cholesterol metabolism, probably testosterone, for instance. Um, uh, and also, it's very inefficient. So you can only, by modulating metabolism, reduce the percentage of whatever metabolic process that uh, leads to a particular kind of damage. Uh, because if you reduce that to zero, of course, you will not be alive anymore. Uh, and so you, you inevitably are leaving a certain percentage of whatever that reactive process uh, intervening between metabolism and damage is to leak out, cause damage, and proceed to ethology. So uh, again, a, a, a favorable approach, one that we are for, uh, but not one that really gets to the root of the problem. And that was really sort of considered to be it for the options up until the year 2000, when our scientific founder, Dr. Arvid Gray, realized that no, there is actually a third way here, a sort of a middle path between reactive disease care and traditional geroscience. And that is to attack the cellular and molecular damage of aging directly. Uh, so you, you are leaving metabolism to do what it needs to do to keep you alive, fit and healthy, you are not waiting until a person already has advanced pathology. You are removing, repairing, replacing, or rendering harmless the damage itself directly, and thereby cutting the Gordian knot that links metabolism to pathology. Um, and it has you know, all the advantages that the geroscience approach I just laid out does not have. Um, so let's go through uh, why this approach makes sense. Uh, so I'm going to tell you that uh, the damage repair approach has a greater effect size, that it has superior iterability, that it has a lower intrinsic risk of side effects, and that it removes pre-existing damage. So we'll start with the first, that is the greater effect size. So this is a simple schematic. A uh, person starts their life or you know their post-developmental existence with a certain functional reserve. This could be the number of dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra, as we were mentioning earlier, and you progressively lose those over time. And then you intervene with a hypothetical intervention that intervenes in metabolism and thereby slows the rate of damage accumulation. Here we've got a hypothetical therapy that cuts the rate of damage by 50%. Well, what would that do? that would raise your total health span by about 20%, and it would double your remaining health span. Um, and this is not a you know, plucked out of the air hypothetical example. Uh, this actually is modeled after what happens with cow restriction when it is intervened in mice in late middle age. Um, so that is pretty good. Uh, that would be favorable over uh, the existing course of aging and dying like your neighbors. 
uh, but it has some pretty clear limitations. Now, what if you did comparable repair? So here, instead of slowing the rate of accumulation of cellular molecular damage by 50%, here we are repairing the existing burden of damage by 50%. And here you can see that there's several advantages here. You are actually removing the existing burden of damage. You are restoring functional reserve to a level it was at an earlier age because the structural integrity of the tissue is returned to what it was at a younger age. And whereas here you've got continuous therapy to keep the accumulation of cellular molecular damage slowed through this process, here you can do this periodically and each time remove a similar percentage of damage. And although you still have a gradual accumulation because you are not able to clear all the damage at each round, you still wind up with a dramatically larger effect on total and remaining health span. So that conceptually has a lot of strength. And this is what I mean by superior iterability, this ability to not just come back and apply the same damage removal at each stage, but what can you do as you improve the therapy? So uh, suppose you had a hypothetical second generation of a so-called messing with metabolism or geroscience approach. So you have a person who has received the first generation of therapies, their rate of aging is slowed by 50%, now we come in with a second generation of therapies that slows the rate of aging by a further 50%. That sort of sounds dramatic on a relative basis, but as you can see on an absolute basis, uh, it doesn't do very much. And you are increasingly going to be up against the limits of physiological tolerability for the reasons that I laid out before, that these are the same processes that keep us alive. You know, if you lower a person's glucose from 200 milligrams per deciliter to 100 milligrams of deciliter, you have done them a world of good. If you lower it from 100 milligrams of deciliter to 50 milligrams per deciliter, you are putting them in constant danger of a hypoglycemic crisis. So there's just only so far you can push this. And even if you do push it, you are not going to get, you know, a dramatic further increase in potential extension of healthy lifespan. Whereas if you come up with a second generation of damage repair approaches targeting the same broad sweep of damage, you can have a much more dramatic further extension because again, you are removing existing damage in the tissues and thereby restoring the organism to a state at a more youthful level and allowing you to extend life further on. Now that would not be as good as having that second generation in the first place so that you could remove three quarters of the damage in the very first instance here, but it still is a lot better than doing just half the first time and staying on that same path. Now I've been emphasizing this idea that there is a lower intrinsic risk of side effects. Um, and I've given you a foreshadowing of why that's expected to be so. So uh, your target when you are doing a messing with metabolism or geroscience type approach is metabolic processes, which as I've said a couple of times, you know, evolution spent a billion years of eukaryotic life trying to develop you to live the way that you do. Uh, there are intrinsic trade-offs that evolution has sorted out to produce an organism that is fit. If you come in with a small molecule and say, no, no, I want you to, you know, increase the activity of your uh, DNA repair mechanism by 50%, inevitably there is a reason why that was not set higher than it was in the first place. You are going to have uh, adverse side effects there. Whereas damage repair, you are targeting something that is not supposed to be there in the first place. There is no evolutionary process that put uh, accumulated senescent cells automatically in your body. Those are side effects of metabolic processes that were designed to put you alive, but they are not themselves things that are supposed to be in a body or it would have been in the body in the first place. So you're removing something that is typically inert and even if it's not inert, it is adverse and you, removing it is going to be, I won't say inevitably and in all cases, completely beneficial, but it's clearly going to be an improvement and it's definitely not going to be intrinsically damaging the way uh, messing with a metabolic process is. Uh, and also, 
the dosing schedule is advantageous because as we were saying a moment ago, you know, if you want to slow a person's rate of aging by 50%, well, as with any drug, whether it's a statin or a hypertension drug or a blood sugar drug or GLP-1 receptor agonist, um, to reap the benefits of those drugs, you have to be on them all the time. As soon as you stop taking your statin, you will start having higher LDL cholesterol and your atherosclerosis will proceed. If you stop your GLP-1 receptor agonist all of a sudden, your body mass will start to increase rapidly because you are no longer going to have the advantageous effect on society that that drug uh, gives to you. And so uh, by contrast, because damage repair approaches remove damage that is already there, you can do it on a hit and run basis because you have cleared out damage and it's going to take as it does in normal aging, a long time for that damage to accumulate to the point where it is pathological, right? It takes you 60 or 80 years before a person develops Parkinson's disease because you lose dopaminergic neurons slowly. If you replete those dopaminergic neurons in a damage repair approach, it's going to take a long time for you to get back close to the threshold of pathology again, where you would need another round of therapy. And so that gives you a lot of time to recuperate if necessary and to minimize the side effects because you only have a short term. You know, even if there is a side effect of the therapy, you're only exposed to it for a brief period during which you're actually being treated. Um, so let's go through. Yes, Amit. So I think conceptually what you're saying makes a lot of sense. I think one big problem that we all have in the field is that we don't have good reliable markers that can measure the damage before the pathology has occurred, right? That's the bigger problem. So convincing yeah. people that they should start taking medication even before they're seeing any symptoms of the disease, is, you know, you know the whole thing. My question yeah. is, if you were to compare the damage repair approach versus metabolic modulation approach in pathologies, um, do, w how would you compare those two approaches in that context? Uh, so I would say two things about that, one of which is, of course, your question partially answers itself. Uh, I, obviously, what we want to do is actually develop good biomarkers for uh, damage. Of course, people are working on this. Um, we, when we first ran trials for damage repair therapies for beta amyloid, we were only going on clinical diagnoses because we couldn't open up people's brains and look to see whether they had beta amyloid in their brains or not, right? And so we learned later that roughly a third of the people that were in the clinical trials for beta amyloid clearance drugs uh, actually had no significant beta amyloid in their brains in the first place. And so they were being given a therapy that was not actually benefiting them, which was not helpful. Whereas now, uh, we have a mixture of both PET tracers and also the ability to measure uh, beta amyloid markers and uh, aberrant tau markers, both in cerebrospinal fluid and now actually increasingly in plasma, such that this is going to be a non-issue in very short order. You have good non-invasive methods of measuring the burden of damage in the brain. Uh, and of course, as you'll be aware, you know, lots of people are working on better ways to figure out a burden, person's burden of senescent cells. I recognize that is a hard thing to do, but you know, part of the answer is just, well, let's develop ways of doing this, right? Um, but at that same time, there's another kind of answer to this question, which is at some level, it actually doesn't matter. If you're 50 years old, you have a burden of all of this damage. And so uh, we could, in principle, give people a lower level of any of these therapies starting at a given age when we can predictably say you have some of this damage, even if, you know, we can't tell that without like actually opening up your brain and looking uh, and keep you away from developing a pathological burden of that damage. That's the key point is, you know, if I, if I give you a sufficiently safe uh, therapy or it is sufficiently short in its duration, you know, even if I give you a therapy that removes damage that you don't really have significant amounts of, I haven't likely given you any harm because again, the target is something that shouldn't be there in the first place. You're removing something that is purely a harmful uh, cellular or molecular lesion in your tissues. Uh, right, I mean, we'll get to the second part in a second, but just wanted to comment on that. 
um, my intuitive sense is that everybody, even though we'll accumulate most of these damages that, that we, we try to target, the level of those damages may be different. So some people may have, say, high, yeah. much higher senescence burden than the others, whereas others may have more beta amyloid uh, accumulation in the brain. So, 100%, so, such as in this right, graph. Right, so which makes it, and, and you yourself said that if, if you start taking, giving them treatments for things that they don't have, then it will become a problem. Um, the question then is, then how, like, I guess going back to the biomarker question, right? Like there must, so it, like said, it, it's, not, it's not, well, it's not clear to me that it will be a problem, right? I mean, again, the target mm -hmm. is something that should not be there in the first place, uh, unless the therapy is really incredibly dangerous and uh, that danger can't be recuperated from over, you know, because again, you only have to give these therapies intermittently. Uh, you can, you know, treat someone who does not have a particular damage without having to worry very much about the fact that you haven't really done anything to them. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, prob the big problem in the early trials for beta amyloid removing antibodies uh, principally was that you failed to get success in the clinical trial because you were going after a target that wasn't there. So you wanted for clinical trial purposes to enrich for people who, you know, all of them had substantial beta amyloid because you wanted a drug that would remove beta amyloid. But in clinical practice, you know, I would happily go in for a beta amyloid removing therapy tomorrow uh, with no clue as to whether I have beta amyloid in my brain because I don't want beta amyloid in there. And if I go in and do nothing, uh, you know, I, I'd rather not have it there. So if there's no air and I go through therapy, you know, that is a pain in the neck and maybe my insurance company will have something to say about that. Uh, but it's not something that we have to worry about intrinsically the way we have to do with, you know, putting someone on a drug to lower their blood sugar if I don't know what your starting blood sugar is. Again, if I take your blood sugar from 100 milligrams per deciliter to 50 milligrams per deciliter, you're in danger. Uh, if I give you a therapy to remove beta amyloid and you don't actually have any beta amyloid, no consequence, right? Except for the limited intrinsic uh, side effects of the therapy itself. Yeah, I mean, I, I, honestly, I, this was a leading question. Really, I wanted to, and you kind of said it anyway. I think the cognitive dissonance in most people when they think about damage and damage repair is they think the damage, they associate damage with the disease. But the damage occurs a lot before we actually develop yes. the symptoms of a disease. So you're actually talking yes. about a preventive therapy rather than a treatment. Um, yes. So the disease never occurs in the first place because if we get rid of those damage earlier on, uh, much, much before we develop those symptoms. I think that's that's yeah. what I'm So, it's, so again, we want to intervene with the damage before the onset of pathology. Yes, 100%. And the, 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 I mean, intrinsically, it's a lot easier then because you don't, you're not dealing with this feedback process that I was discussing earlier, right? The, the earlier you intervene, uh, the easier it is, both because the burden of damage is lesser uh, and you don't have these feedbacks working to make the whole process accelerate more rapidly. Yeah. Um, and I will get in a bit later into a good example of how this is actually happening. So that's a, it's a bit of an, an advanced uh, layup you've given me there. Thank you. Um, so let's look at, so going back to this contrast in side effects, um, let's look at an example that a lot of you will know because some of you are in labs working on this and others you have, will have heard presentations from SRF Ed and from Amit's lab uh, working on cellular senescence. So as most of you will recall, um, cellular senescence is a process whereby a variety of stressors to the cell uh, activates this intrinsic uh, sort of safety valve process in the cells that uh, causes growth arrest and a particular secretory phenotype in the cells. And this serves important short-term processes in the cell. It can prevent a cell that has DNA damage from becoming cancerous uh, by limiting its replication. Uh, if you have been injured, it limits fibrosis by uh, causing uh, epi ep uh, ep epidermal from mesenchymal transition cells to uh, stop proliferating and limit fibrosis. Uh, this is also used in embryonic development and in deciduation and other essential biological processes. The problem is these senescent cells accumulate in your tissues over time, and eventually that 
perversely actually promotes termogenesis by modifying the local environment and tissue aging by uh, taking a bunch of cells out of your system uh, and by the secretory phenotype uh, distorting your immune system and otherwise uh, messing with your metabolism in one of those feedback processes that I was outlining before. Um, so what might one do about that? Um, so one thing you might consider is to interfere with the machinery that causes a cell to become senescent in the first place. Uh, you may think that that is a crazy idea, and I agree, but there have been and are people who are exploring this as a potential therapy in a variety of contexts. Um, the problem, of course, is that, as I was saying just a moment ago, like one of the main reasons why cells go senescent is to prevent them from becoming cancers. And indeed, 50% uh, of all cancers have a mutation in one of the senescence uh, guardians called p53 um, because you know if you can get rid of something that is stopping a cell from proliferating that allows it to proceed to cancer um, that also would uh, prevent a lot of other uh, senescence driven beneficial processes such as cells going senescent in order to stop fibrosis um, so that is not a very good approach to dealing with this problem a much more popular and much more sensible approach, although still not the one we would favor, is what are called xenomorphics. So these are typically small molecule drugs that modulate the SASP, the senescence associated secretory phenotype. This is the cytokines and other proteins that are secreted by senescence cells and cause a lot of the long-term harm that senescence cells cause. Um, there's a lot of different approaches you can take to this. Uh, one that I'll be highlighting is up here, interleukin-6, which is uh, one of the most prominent members of the SASP, uh, signals to the JAK-STAT pathway, and actually there is some evidence that the JAK-STAT whale pathway uh, also promotes interleukin-6 uh, production. And so if you were to interfere with that, you might think uh, that you would in improve aging phenotypes. Um, so this is data out of the Kirkland lab. Uh, they started off with uh, cells driven senescence through uh, irradiation or serial passage. And they showed that any of three different JAK inhibitors, uh, two of which are actually approved, FDA approved clinical drugs uh, at a variety of different concentrations will damp down the production of various different SAS factors, not just interleukin-6. Um, and that it could do the same thing in vivo in aged mice. Uh, so these are 20 month old mice treated with JAKify, which is an FDA approved uh, JAK inhibitor and uh, many of their uh, uh, SAS factors are reduced through treatment with this. And uh, indeed, as you might think, when you take the SAS away, this rejuvenates a lot of the physical functions. Uh, so their ambulation increases, their grip strength improves, their speed on a treadmill improves. Uh, they are in many ways rejuvenated mice. And these are 24 month old mice. So these are like seriously old mice that they have made act a lot more like young mice. So sign me up, right? Um, well, <laughs> this same drug uh, has black box warning around it uh, from the FDA, warning about increased risk of serious heart related events, cancer, blood clots, and death. Uh, and the European Medicines Agency uh, has recognized all those same harms and has taken it one step further and said that really this should only be an absolute last resort medication in people who are, for instance, age 65 years or above, i.e. the people you would most want to give one of these drugs, uh, those at increased risk of major adverse cardiac events. Uh, again, this is going to be a lot of the people that you would otherwise want to give these drugs. Uh, those who smoke have done so for a long time or in the past, and those at increased risk of cancer. And I will repeat myself by saying, you know, again, because those are diseases, those cause diseases associated with senescence, uh, you might think that those are exactly the people you would want to give Jackify. And yet here we are saying, no, 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 do not give them Jackify under any circumstances uh, unless there is no other option. Um, so this is just like part of the genus face of the senescent cell associated phenotype, right? It has good physiological functions and it has adverse physiological effects. And sometimes those are, you know, the same effects essentially just 
what is the time scale over what you are looking at, uh, you know, acute versus chronic. So the alternative damage repair approach, which a lot of you are familiar with and certainly is something that Amit works on. Oh, and that's all I'll use. Um, another sort of problem with the salmonomorphic approach uh, is that, of course, interleukin-6 has other functions, and uh, as I was saying a moment ago, and one of those is actually that it acts as a myokine, in other words, as a secreted factor that, at minimum, uh, improves performance during exercise and may actually be part of the adaptation process in response to exercise. And, you know, exercise is, you know, one of the go-to uh, means of preventing age-related disease and disability, and yet here we are saying, let us give you a drug that is going to interfere with the best anti-aging therapy that we have right now, right? So uh, obviously this is a, a serious problem. We, we do not want to be doing this if we had any other approach that we could conceive. Unfortunately, we do have another approach we can conceive. Um, this is to actually repair the damage. In this case, remove senescent cells themselves directly after they arise. So uh, again, following this flow chart that I've shown you a few times, uh, we are going to allow, yeah. we are going to allow senescent cells to arise. We are not going to interfere with the process of senescent cells arising. We are not going to interfere with the SASP. We are going to target the damaged cells directly after they have formed. And by doing that, you abrogate the SAS that they are producing and therefore the adverse effects that they are causing on their neighboring cells. Uh, and you can restore the organism to normal health. Potentially, you can also allow healthy cells to replicate and take over some of the space that the senescent cells were occupying. And even if the cell, the organism doesn't have that ability intrinsically, of course, you could come in after the fact with cell therapy, which is another damage repair approach. And this is some of the work that Dr. Sharma has actually done in our lab at Sens Research Foundation. Uh, here they exploited the uh, aberrant iron metabolism of uh, senescent cells to ablate them. Uh, and these had broader effects on pools of senescent cells that his group showed uh, are otherwise recalcitrant to conventional senolytic drugs, meaning drugs that destroy senescent cells. This new approach was uh, benign to non-senescent cells, but effectively destroyed a wide spectrum of senescent cells compared to previous efforts. And as you probably know, uh, these drugs are amazing. Um, they have been shown to uh, restore stem cell function. They prevent, ameliorate, or reverse multiple models of or actual age-related diseases in normally aging mice. They increase median lifespan, and they seem to increase late flight survival as well. These are quite remarkable drugs and uh, they've attracted a lot of attention uh, both within academic science and increasingly uh, in pharmaceutical companies working to develop these into actual therapies for humans. Uh, I will give you a second concrete example. Uh, this is the so-called amyloid cascade. So as most people know, uh, beta amyloid is a protein that is generated in the brain, and when it aggregates, um, it leads to eventually the development of the most common neurodegenerative disease of aging, which is Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this is a cascade is a process that starts with beta amyloid aggregation. This leads to the missorting of the tau protein from the axon to the dendrite, and the uh, spread of aberrant tau out from the medial temporal locus uh, where it, it tends to accumulate with age independently of beta amyloid. When beta amyloid is present though, uh, it pushes beta amyloid out from the MTL uh, into the neocortex and elsewhere. And this uh, also leads to microglial activation and eventually to cognitive decline, dementia, and death. Um, now, this model was developed in the late 1990s, the early 2000s, uh, and multiple groups tried to attack beta amyloid through one mechanism or another, 
and drugs kept failing for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons that people got this sort of skepticism about the beta amyloid model was exactly the failure of those drugs. And part of the problem there was that they were not paying attention to how these various agents were targeting beta amyloid. So the great majority of those therapies used a messing with metabolism or geroscience type approach where the strategy was let us inhibit the production of beta amyloid. Uh, so the amyloid precursor protein, APP, is a transmembrane protein that is sequentially cleaved by these two enzymes, beta secretase and gamma secretase. Uh, that produces beta amyloid monomers, which then aggregate into soluble oligomeric species and eventually form insoluble beta amyloid plaques in the brain. And so the idea was, well, let's just uh, target one or the other of these two secretases and you won't produce beta amyloid monomers and that will prevent the oligomers and the plaques from forming and we will prevent or reverse Alzheimer's disease. Um, interesting idea, did not work. <laughs> did not work over and over again. Um, now, some of these drugs failed to true off-target effects, i.e. they had toxicity that was unrelated to their effects uh, on beta amyloid, uh, toxicity in the liver or the skin or other organs. Uh, another of these drugs just failed outright. Uh, this was a gamma secretase inhibitor that was also a, um, uh, a, a an NSAID of sorts, uh, and it just failed in the conventional way that a drug fails. It failed to improve cognition and it was shelved. But most of these drugs actually made cognitive function worse. And you go, well, <laughs> how can it possibly be that a drug that is targeting beta amyloid uh, can make cognition worse if beta amyloid is what's driving cognitive decline? Um, well, there's a reason for that, which is of course, the body did not start producing beta amyloid just to give you dementia when you get old, right? There is a physiological function for beta amyloid when it's present in the monomer. And one of those functions is pretty clear now is an antimicrobial peptide. Uh, as a lot of you will know, there's a lot of evidence now that part of what's going on in Alzheimer's disease is uh, neuro infection with herpes simplex virus, P. gingivalis, others possibly including the Lyme disease uh, pathogen. Uh, and this causes uh, A beta production, and it seems to be acting as an antimicrobial peptide in the brain. Uh, you can even give a variety of organisms transgenic A beta, and it protects them against a variety of infections. So, uh, obviously, if you are preventing the brain from protecting it itself from infections from a variety of sources, you are going to worsen cognitive decline and you are also uh, going to make the problem you already have with microglial inflammation even worse. Um, now, the alternative is again, to go in and remove the existing damage. So we are going to leave the secretases alone. We are going to allow the brain to produce beta amyloid, but once it aggregates into these oligomers and or these plaques, we are going to remove the damage directly. Uh, and now we have, for the first time in human history, disease modifying therapies against Alzheimer's disease, D drugs that actually will slow the degeneration of the brain. Uh, this is just one of these. This is a drug called lecanemab. Uh, this is an antibody that targets protofibrils of beta amyloid. Uh, and indeed, in a dose dependent manner, these drugs reduce the amount of beta amyloid in the brain, not you know, sort of slow the accumulation of beta amyloid, but remove it from the brain. Uh, and it increases therefore the proportion of uh, patients that are positive for any level of beta at all. Uh, and it improves brain function over time. Sorry, I should be precise. It slows the rate of cognitive decline over time uh, on multiple different cognitive tests. This I've given here is the Amazon's Elite Alzheimer's Disease Assessment Scale, Cognitive Subscale. Um, now you come back to me and you say, well, okay, hang on. You came in saying you're gonna remove the damage and reverse this process. Why are these people still you know, continuing to suffer cognitive decline? Well, that is because these trials are being run in people 
who are already in the mild cognitive, so-called mild cognitive impairment stage, which is not mild at all, or actually in early Alzheimer's dementia. And at that stage, a person has not only accumulated a great deal of beta amyloid pathology, but a lot of the downstream effects of the cascade, right? Again, beta amyloid accumulation causes downstream effects, increases the amount and increases the spread of aberrant tau and increases neuroinflammation via microglia. Um, and so by the time these people are being entered into these trials uh, in this stage or this stage, you've already lost a third of the neurons into your, your entorhinal cortex uh, and you have extensive tau pathology. And unfortunately, you know, once you have lost those neurons, they are not coming back. Uh, so uh, you are doing something on one of these various mechanisms and you are, we, we know now, they've actually reported this, you are then slowing the accumulation of further tau damage, these neurofibrillary tangles going forward, but you can't remove the existing burden of damage just by targeting beta amyloid at this late stage in the game. So your alternatives are either number one, you develop additional rejuvenation biotechnologies that directly target these other lesions and thereby revert the entire process back to its youthful norm, or you go in so early that you can abrogate the cascade. And indeed, there are now three clinical trials going on to do exactly that. This is one of them with lecanemab, the same uh, anti-beta amyloid antibody that I highlighted a moment ago. They are taking people in their 50s who can be shown on PET scans or on blood tests <clears throat> to have uh, beta amyloid in their brains, but they show normal cognitive function for their age. Of course, most of us know that normal cognitive function for a 50 year old is not normal function for a 50, for 20 year old, but they don't have anywhere near so-called mild cognitive impairment. They're normal for their age and they're going to give them lecanemab or placebo over the course of several years. And the idea will be, let us prevent, let us not only remove the existing beta amyloid in their brains, let us prevent the downstream consequences and prevent, potentially prevent them from ever getting Alzheimer's disease or you know, project it further and further into the future. Uh, and I will add, uh, giving us time to develop additional rejuvenation biotechnologies against these other lesions. Um, here at Sun's Research Foundation, we are actually devel developing an additional rejuvenation biotechnology targeting one of those sources of damage, which is let's go after the actual uh, microbes that uh, invade the aging brain and remove those directly uh, so that they don't cause you know, the additional beta amyloid production that the brain uses to defend it or their own effects on inflammation via the microglia or otherwise. <clears throat> um, and just to say that I'm not simply you know, cherry picking a couple of examples here, these are the absolute best anti-aging interventions that the geroscience approach has ever developed. These are calorie restriction and rapamycin. Uh, these are very powerful interventions, but unsurprisingly, when they are having profound effects on metabolism in order to slow the aging process, they also have profound adverse side effects. I am not rubbishing either of these approaches. I practice calorie restriction for 25 years. I am taking rapamycin. I'm for it. I'm just saying they're not the solution that we need. Um, and these are some of the reasons why, you know, this is a dangerous experiment that we are on. We need something better. Um, I apologize that I'm clearly gonna be running over time, but I am getting to the last section here. Um, as I've highlighted, like one of the major advantages of the damage repair approach is again, that it's not just slowing the rate at which damage accumulates, it is removing existing damage. And I'll remind you that when we talk about damage as regards SENS, we are talking about things that by definition, the body does not remove all by itself. Um, so, uh, you know, a reversible DNA lesion is not what we're talking about. We're talking about a fixed mutation uh, or the senescent cells that the body can initially clear using the immune system are not what we're talking about. We're talking about the ones that continue to accumulate over time with age. Um, so as an example, uh, the brain, you know, you are losing neurons in your brain with age, particularly once you have a significant amount of beta amyloid in your brain, but also the dopaminergic neuron loss that I highlighted before. 
And once those neurons are gone, there is no way that you can stimulate metabolism to get them back, right? There is a very, very limited neurogenic zone in the human brain, uh, basically restricted to areas around the hippocampus and with a certain amount of migration uh, into the striatum from that. Uh, but outside of that, you know, neurons are lost and they do not come back. So you may be able through BDNF or some other growth factor to slow the rate at which those neurons are lost, but once they're gone, they're gone. Uh, whereas the damage repair approach is, well, <laughs> let's not accept that. Let's actually replace those neurons using biotechnology. Um, and the most advanced case of this is again, in the case of Parkinson's disease, there are now multiple clinical trials afoot uh, to use cells that are derived from cellular reprogramming. So taking in most of these cases, the patient's own cells, reprogram them into, in this case, dopamine progenitor cells and implanting them back into their brain to replace the dopaminergic neurons that they have lost. So this is a report from the New England Journal of Medicine from 2020. Uh, this is a biomedical device entrepreneur named George Doc Lopez. Uh, they took fibroblasts from this patient. They developed 4 million dopaminergic progenitor cells from those fibroblasts. They implanted them into the putamen uh, sequentially in each hemisphere and they gave him no immunosuppression because again, these are his cells, right? They use reprogramming from his cells to make these neurons and then they tracked them. And when they took clinical measures at uh, 18 and 24 months after implantation, they showed that the cells had survived and seemed to possibly even be expanding and that his clinical measures had either stabilized or improved over the course of that year and a half to two years. Another example that is familiar to some of you from lab meetings uh, is mitochondrial DNA deletions. So uh, when, so each of our cells contains many uh, mitochondria and when one of those mitochondria suffers a minor mutation, the cell does have a way to deal with that through mitophagy, this recycling process for uh, removing damaged mitochondria. Unfortunately, there is a form of mitochondrial DNA damage that your cells seem to be completely incapable of dealing with, which is these large deletions uh, in the mitochondrial genome that accumulate over time. And uh, we are confident that the cell does not do a good job of removing these because we essentially in uh, most mitotic cells, we see that these not only accumulate with age, but that the cells in which they occur wind up being homoplasmic for uh, such mitochondria. So in other words, you don't see a cell with say 50-50 deletion bearing mitochondria versus wild type mitochondria. You see either cells that have wild type mitochondria or cells that are completely overtaken by mitochondria that have these deletions in them. And that there's, there's several proposed mechanisms whereby that would happen, but one of them is in fact, that the very effects of a large mitochondrial deletion causes them to not throw off reactive oxygen species because oxfos has been turned off and that makes them invisible effectively to some of the main mechanisms of mitophagy. And so you can stimulate mitophagy all day long, you're not going to fix this problem. Um, a lot of caveat that there is an unusual approach to mitophagy that uh, Amuthas lab is exploring, but it is not simply like, let's boost up the existing mitophagy machinery in the sort of naive way that a lot of other labs are doing. Um, but a more sophisticated engineering approach that Dr. Munatham's lab is using is allotopic expression. So here we are saying, okay, you have these uh, mitochondria that have these large deletions in them. Uh, we are going to render those mutations harmless by a form of gene therapy in which we are going to deliver a version of the gene for a particular um, mitochondrial encoded gene into the nucleus with suitable modifications to allow it to be expressed from the nucleus. It is going to be produced in the cytosol, uh, suitably targeted so that it goes into the mitochondria and then you are effectively creating spare parts for the mitochondria, even if, the mitochondria can no longer produce these various subunits of the mitochondrial electron transport chain uh, the complexes, you are delivering those uh, subunits 
into the mitochondria where it can use them and restore function, despite the fact that the we don't have a solution for the deletions themselves. Uh, and indeed, uh, in 2016, they showed that they could use this approach to restore OXFOS in cells bearing mutations for ATP8 that also afflicted ATP6. Uh, and we have in press right now uh, our report of doing this in vivo. So she has an exogenous ATP8 transgene. This has been uh, inserted into a safe harbor locus in the genome of mice. Uh, that leads to the production of the exogenous ATP8 protein. That protein is successfully delivered to the mitochondria. It is incorporated into the electron transport chain. It has ubiquitous expression in every organ they have looked at. It does not cause immune problems. And uh, we would like it to restore function. Unfortunately, the mutation in the mice that we put it into proved to be so mild that there is no way that they can detect a difference. But we can certainly say that the allotopically produced protein is in fact functioning the way we need it to function and could be done uh, if we had a better mouse model than this. So uh, I'm going to end where a lot of people's in this field's slides begin. Um, aging really is the major cause of disease and disability on earth. 110,000 people die of aging via you know, one age-related disease or another every single day. And they spend decades before that suffering with the diagnosable age-related diseases that are caused by this degenerative process. We have to put an end to this. And the traditional approach of going after one age-related disease or another is completely a failed model. I do not want to cure your cancer only to have you fall prey to Alzheimer's disease two years later. Conversely, I don't want to find a way to delay your Alzheimer's disease by five years, only to have your brain destroyed anyway by a glioblastoma two years later. And even if I had the equivalent of cow restriction or rapamycin available to slow every aging process across the board, I don't want to just delay Alzheimer's and cancer and heart disease and Parkinson's and all the rest of them by five years or 10 years and then suffer them all in the same order just delayed by five or 10 years. They are still unacceptable. I want degenerative aging under full indefinite medical control. And SENS is the only strategy that is even on the table that could plausibly get us there. Thank you for my rant. I will take any questions. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I will open it up for questions in just a moment, but I want to also give you, uh, invite you to uh, rant on one of your favorite topics for just a moment, <laughs> which is the relationship <laughs> of, um, you know, a lot of our students are encountering the hallmarks of um, aging um, uh, and their yeah. relationship to the SEN7. Um, I know we don't have a ton of time, right. but I'd like to hear, you know, a, a, a three minute take on it. <laughs> Sure. I actually have a slide on that. I figured somewhere. you would. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So yeah, as Lily has just said, um, a lot of you will be more familiar with the so-called hallmarks of aging. So uh, Dr. DeGray, when he came up with the damage repair approach, that was in the year 2000. And a lot of people thought that this idea of dividing up the uh, pathological processes in aging into different aspects and targeting them individually, they really didn't think that was a viable approach. Uh, a bit over 10 years later in 2013, a paper called The Hallmarks of Aging came out that essentially took a similar division process, although it differed in important ways. Uh, and th this has now become sort of the dogma. Like everyone will say, you know, I am dealing with XYZ because XYZ is one of the hallmarks of aging and you know here are the diseases that are associated with it. This is, this is just routine thinking now. It was anathema in the year 2000. Um, and you might think, well, okay, you know, the hallmarks is another schema. Let's just use that one. There is a reason why we are sticking with the SEN7 as we call them um, because uh, there's a, a bunch of reasons, but the, the core reason really is that this is all damage in the way that I have described earlier, and it allows you a direct way to target that damage. So it's a, a very efficient way 
it is more conceptually coherent rather than just there's a certain arbitrariness to the hallmarks where you know if you can show that something goes wrong with aging uh, and that some anti-aging intervention slows it down you say it's a hallmark of aging but that you know, eventually leads to an infinite regress because an infinite number of things go wrong with aging uh, and a lot of the hallmarks of aging because it comes out of conventional geroscience thinking are not damage but processes so it will talk about telomere shortening or it will talk about not you know the accumulation of senescent cells in your tissues but the process of senescence which you know you intervening in the process of senescence is the same sort of problem we were talking about earlier or they will talk about proteostasis right maintaining your proteins in a non aggregated non dysfunctional state uh, but you know the the real problem is not so much you know how do you maintain that because inevitably it's going to fall apart that's just part of the aging process uh, instead we want to say no no the problem here is not maintaining proteostasis quote unquote. the problem here is the accumulation of the aggregates let's remove the aggregates so it's a it's a it is not a comprehensive strategy it's just a catalog and it doesn't give you a clear way to intervene in the pro in the process and to the extent that it suggests intervention it tends to suggest conventional geroscience approaches and that's why uh, the sense approach is superior because uh, it catalogs damage in a way that is conceptually clear is finite and allows you a mode for intervention for all of it and in particular allows you a damage repair intervention approach thank you for that question Lily. <laughs> Thank you. And, oh, um, and I have I have two blog posts elaborating uh, probably more coherently than I just did on this subject. I was definitely about to plug your blog as well. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, Michael runs a blog on our website that um, tackles this amongst many topics. And um, if I do say so myself or volunteer you for this, Michael, I know Michael's always um, very helpful. And when I uh, need to ask him, hey, do you think that this is a viable approach or do you think this is damage repair or what do you, so he's, he's a great resource in that sense. Um, but I also want to give the students a chance to ask any questions that you have. I know a few of you are running over and needing to head to experiments, so that is okay. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, ask those questions. And if not, then we will adjourn. <laughs> I do see one question. Go ahead, Joshua. Hi, Michael. Is there anywhere where I, where I could be exposed to like your rhetoric at the end about how aging is curative of all these different diseases and rather than targeting one, we should just target aging and that'll solve them all. Is there anywhere where I can be more exposed to that? Just so I could, it's a great thing to memorize to, you know, introduce people to longevity in a way that is eminently rational. So it'd be good to memorize it so I could kind of share that same line of rhetoric. Uh, I want I want to be clear. You want uh, just the actual rant that I just gave you, uh, uh, so that you can repeat it somewhere. Basically, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sure I can type it up. Yes, absolutely. And I think there is um, a, if, there is a book if, if you if you, you wrote that, right. That's also so a yes, yeah. They, they, there are there are rants to that effect uh, embedded in various places in ND Aging. That's also true. Yes, I wrote uh, ND Aging with Dr. DeGray and. 2006 through 2009 uh because there's a second edition of it um and yes there the, the the whole damage repair approach the various targets and the the general rant that like we ought to go after aging like an outlaw uh is embedded in that but i, I will happily type out a version of my rant at the end there uh for uh whatever use you want to turn it to absolutely thank you so much Mike, uh, feel free to, to chime in. You guys don't have to raise your hand. You can just go for it. <laughs> yeah, I have a quick, have a quick question. Uh, where does the programming, reprogramming approach, like partial reprogramming, fits mm -hmm. in one of the programs here? Uh, I think you're asking uh, where does partial reprogramming fit in the SEND 7? Yeah. Right, so uh, let me divide that question into two kinds of answers. So uh, the most direct answer is that it, it fits under replenish ends, right? So the most clear way that you can use cellular reprogramming is to do 
patient-specific cell therapy. So I, I gave the example earlier on uh, of using cellular reprogramming to take a patient's fibroblasts, turn them into dopaminergic uh, precursor cells, and implant them in the brain of patients with Parkinson's disease so that they can have new dopaminergic neurons that will replace and thereby repair uh, some of the damage that's accumulated with aging. Um, people, of course, are also doing partial reprogramming in vivo. Um, I think that is probably too risky an approach to be taking in humans who, uh, the way that cancer develops in humans is a little bit different from in mice. I, I'm nervous about doing that. And also it's quite untargeted. Uh, you know, you never can control which cells and which it goes into. Uh, and you are unlikely to get them all part of, you know, because the, the efficiency of reprogramming is very, very low, which is totally fine when you're doing it ex vivo because you can take the reprogrammed cells and use them then for therapy. But, you know, if you wanted to do this in vivo, you would ideally want to partially reprogramming, you know, the great majority of cells in a tissue. And it's, there's no one saying that that can plausibly be done and done safely uh, in vivo. So I would divide that in, in two ways. There's sort of, there's an over-enthusiastic embrace of the idea that this is the, the solution to many, many, many problems with aging, whereas I would say it is a solution to a restricted set of problems in aging. I actually have a blog post also uh, on this subject, which I will happily give you a link for if you are interested, Michael. Hey, Michael, can I tag uh, to your answer a little bit more? Yeah. Yeah, so I think if one was uh, able to isolate cells like hematopoietic stem cells from an elderly, elderly person and, and reprogram it fully or partially and would put them back in the, in the patient, there will be a lot of beneficial outcomes of it, which can help rid of some of these damages that Michael is talking about. A much, much safer approach where you can screen the cells before they're put in for potential um, um, cancer or, or things like that. Um, because of the all of the adverse effects that Michael was listing, uh, I th I also think that partial reprogramming is is potentially too risky for people to to develop therapies around whether it, with to be drugs done in or vivo. viruses. To be done in vivo, yeah. Okay, thanks for the answer. Joshua, go ahead for it. Thank you. How's it going over at Glycosense? I'm really interested myself in. The regeneration of the extracellular matrix. How's it going with um, you know, the attempt to cleave advanced glycation end products? Yeah, I'm I'm glad to have that question. Um, so uh, let, me, let me point to several things there. Um, there could and should be a whole blog post on this question. Uh, so as far as the the former glycosens that we highlighted first and most prominently, which is the the cleavage of advanced glycation end product crosslinks. Um, that is going slowly, but going. Um, we spun out a company uh, called Revel some years back, uh, not directly out of SENS, but out of research that we had funded uh, that had made a preliminary discovery that uh, enzymes that they had located could cleave the most uh, numerous uh, advanced glycation end drug, which is age called uh, glucosapane, uh, out of tissues, and they were hoping to develop that into a rejuvenation biotechnology. Um, unfortunately, I'm told from people inside the company that the people, not in the academic lab where it was developed, but actually inside the spin out company that was formed, Revel Biotechnologies, uh, have been unable to get that to work uh, and have basically, for the moment, shelved that. However, uh, they have alternative enzymes with an alternative target that they are going after, which also probably has biomedical benefit, although it is not uh, as obviously important as uh, glucosapane. I don't know if I am at liberty to disclose what the target is, so I will bear silence on that. But uh, they are they haven't sort of given up the ghost after having discovered that these glucosapane cleaving enzymes don't seem to work in their hands. They are still working, just uh, not working on the target that we originally hoped that they would go after. Um, but there are a lot of other uh, extracellular matrix uh, damage targets that uh, fall under the glyco uh, aegis. Um, and there has been significant progress on all of those. So 
Um, I shouldn't say all of those, that's, that's an exaggeration, but certainly on many of them. Uh, so one important kind of uh, extracellular matrix damage that is definitely life-threatening in humans uh, is medial elastocalcinosis. So uh, you have these lamellar elastin uh, proteins up and down the media of your large arteries that contribute to the elasticity of the arteries and that buffer the pounding of the pulse into target organs such as the kidney and the brain. Um, and over time, <clears throat> excuse me, over time, uh, the sheer mechanical force uh, on those elastin uh, fibrils causes them to progressively fray and sever and uh, calcium accumulates inside of them, which hardens them. They are also subject to attack through enzymes such as uh, some elastase enzymes and matrix, metallo matrix metalloproteases, um, which uh, cause this damage. And then uh, again, like calcium ions get into the elastin core protein and cause them to stiffen. Uh, and so both mechanically and through the addition of calcium, uh, this causes the uh, arteries to stiffen. Um, and that then uh, leads to the increase in systolic blood pressure and to harder pounding because of the loss of elasticity on end target organs. Um, there's a couple of approaches that are being used on this now, uh, one of which is um, this company that has developed these specific antibodies that target the elastin core protein. So normally uh, elastin in your arteries, the core protein is elastin per se, but it is surrounded by fibrillin um, and that shields the elastin core protein so that it is invisible to these antibodies. But once you have this fraying, the fibrillin uh, is sheared away and uh, the elastin core protein is exposed. So uh, this group uh, led out of Clemson University and now with a spinoff called Elastrin, they have these nanoparticles that have uh, antibodies targeting um, elastin. So they only bind to damaged elastin and that then uh, take to it uh, a what you will know is a very common uh, chelating agent, EDTA, just locally to the source of the lesion and thereby can remove calcium uh, from the site of damage. And in preclinical models, at least, uh, that improves everything from uh, aneurysms to uh, age-related vascular dysfunction to a variety of sort of artificially induced insults to the arteries. So uh, there's a bunch of progress. We also have an internal project, which I have written up on uh, and hasn't appeared yet, but is using a similar sort of antibody-based approach to more directly create new elastin in those sources, which one of the reasons why elastin damage accumulates over aging is because post-developmentally, uh, there is no physiological process that leads to normal laying down of elastin. So basically, you know, if you are two years old, you have stopped producing elastin in your arteries for the rest of your life, more or less the only conditions under which you're gonna produce it again are under aberrant conditions such as uh, skin elastosis, which is what you get from too much UV uh, exposure to your skin. Uh, these guys have found that if they deliver proto uh, tropoelastin, which is the precursor to elastin directly locally to a site of injured elastin using a similar antibody-rich approach, uh, they think based on their previous research that they can stimulate the local cells just at the site of injury to produce new elastin and thereby uh, regenerate the artery. Now, they're at a very early stage on this, so I can't say you know they've proven all of this in preclinical pre models yet, uh, but they've done some related work in preclinical models that is quite promising, and I hope, obviously, that they are very successful. So it's just a couple of examples. I also want to throw out, I know that we um, just did a campaign to fund an external project on in the glycosens, uh, uh, the glycosens uh, strand. So um, there should be more probably coming out about that uh, in the coming months. Um, but with that, I think I need to call it because I know there are, I, I see a few more questions going up, but I also know that we are uh, vastly over time. So um, thank you guys all for being here. Um, students, I will see you guys next week for proposal presentations. Please reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, thank you, Michael, for your time. Um, and I think that's it. So thank you very much.